Now, think about the vastness of the universe. Our galaxy contains between 100 and 400 billion stars. Many of them can potentially host planets. Many of those planets might have water in them and be capable of supporting life. And this is just the Milky Way alone. What's the likelihood of other intelligent civilizations existing out there? Well, there's a famous formula called the Drake Equation. It's a mathematical tool to guess how many civilizations from outer space might be able to talk to us in our Milky Way galaxy. It was made by a scientist named Frank Drake in 1961. Here are the variables in it. N is the number of civilizations we could potentially talk to in our galaxy. R star is how fast new stars are born in our galaxy. F sub p is the fraction of stars with planets around them. N sub e is the average number of planets around each star that could support life. F sub l is the fraction of those planets where life might actually start. F sub i is the fraction of planets with life that could become smart civilizations. F sub c is the fraction of smart civilizations that send signals into space. And L is how long those civilizations keep sending signals. Of course, we won't get an exact number like this. It's more like an educated guess, and we don't have any answer to that. But based on at least some information we know, there might be around 100 million worlds where life should have evolved. But if that's the case, then why haven't we met or heard from anyone? This is called the Fermi Paradox. It's named after the famous physicist Enrico Fermi. He asked a simple but very important question. Where is everybody? <laughs> Our universe should be filled with chatty extraterrestrial beings, advanced civilizations, and spaceships zipping around. Yet, when we look up at the night sky or listen with our radio telescopes and antennas, it's eerily quiet. All we get is the so-called great silence of the universe. Scientists from Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute are trying to answer this question. And they're not the only ones. A group called METI, for Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence, organized a workshop in Paris in 2019 to explore this mystery. The workshop brought together experts from various fields, like astrophysics, biology, psychology, and so on. One of the ideas discussed is called the zoo hypothesis. It suggests that perhaps other civilizations do exist, but they're simply not broadcasting their presence. Maybe they know that making direct contact with us could be risky for both sides. So they're intentionally avoiding us, because they're watching us like observing a zoo. They could be using advanced technology we can't detect. There are also some optimistic explanations, like time delays. Space, as you know, is unimaginably big. The time it takes for signals or information to travel across the universe is enormous. It's possible that other civilizations exist, but their signals haven't reached us yet, or ours haven't reached them. But some explanations aren't very optimistic. Like, some scientists think Earth might really be unique. Maybe the conditions that led to life and intelligent beings are so incredibly rare that there are no other planets like ours. Scientists point out that there are many planets similar to Earth, and some are much older. This means there should be plenty of planets where life could evolve. Recent research also suggests that life might be way more resilient than we thought. And, well, while it increases the amount of life existing out there, it also increases the chances that intelligent life doesn't last very long. It might destroy itself before it can spread to other parts of the universe. This is a concerning idea for the future of humanity. The researchers also considered that many planets might be at a similar stage in their development. That's why it's hard for them to explore the universe at the same time. But even they agreed that this explanation is way too far-fetched. And finally, one of the big potential explanations is called the Great Filter. This idea was suggested in the 1990s by Robin Hansen. It says that for life to develop and become advanced like us, it has to overcome some really tough challenges. First of all, the planet itself should have a good stable star and good enough conditions on it. Then life has to start on that planet. These life forms need to be able to reproduce using things like DNA. Simple cells must evolve into more complex cells. More complex organisms with multiple cells must develop. And eventually, these organisms must figure out how to reproduce, which increases genetic diversity. And finally, 
These organisms must be smart enough to use tools, create, and explore things. Finally, they should colonize other planets and star systems without destroying themselves. And maybe one of these stages is so incredibly hard that most civilizations don't make it past that point. This challenge could be something like developing intelligence in the first place. Or it might be the struggle to avoid self-destruction. So, perhaps life isn't rare at all, but most of it doesn't go beyond simple tiny organisms like bacteria. Even if the universe is full of bacteria, they don't become advanced enough to build spaceships. The Great Filter might also be something from outside, like a huge asteroid crashing into a planet, a dangerous burst of gamma rays, or a massive star going supernova. These events could destroy life on any planet, no matter how advanced they are. So, if we've already passed this challenge, it means we could be the only ones in the universe and we can explore it. But if we suddenly hear from a super-advanced civilization, it could mean the hard part of the challenge is still ahead of us. Now, the Fermi Paradox focuses on intelligent civilizations. It just implies that there should be civilizations more advanced than us, or at least as intelligent as us. But if you think about it, why should extraterrestrial life be similar to ours at all? It might be completely different for many important reasons. Life elsewhere might have developed under completely unique conditions. This could lead to forms of intelligence and consciousness very unlike our own. For example, it could have evolved into highly advanced forms that aren't based on biology as we know it. These beings could exist as energy-based entities, silicon-based life forms, or even as a hive mind. And because they have evolved completely differently, they may be capable of things that we aren't capable of. For example, we can't see the entire light spectrum. Our eyes also can't perceive cool things like dark matter. But who knows what the vision of extraterrestrial beings may be capable of? Their abilities might even extend beyond our three-dimensional perception. They might be able to perceive and interact with higher dimensions, which is why they could have unique, interesting insights into the nature of our world. Or maybe they've learned to think outside of time, like in the movie Arrival. For us, we still haven't met them, but for extraterrestrial beings themselves, the concept of time doesn't exist at all. They're simultaneously in the past, present, and future. For humans, something like this is hard to even imagine. Plus, even on Earth, we don't fully grasp how consciousness works or why it exists. We're not even sure when exactly we became conscious. So even if we do encounter extraterrestrial life, it will be hard for us to understand them or communicate with them. We think that they might have entirely different language systems, symbols, and so on. But they might not even have any communication systems at all. As you can see, the possibilities are endless. Evolution is a process that can go in many different directions. It's possible that extraterrestrial life developed in ways we can't easily understand or even imagine. These things are intriguing to think about. There are still no easy answers. The Fermi Paradox remains one of the most exciting and mystery questions in science. Scientists continue to explore these mysteries through a multidisciplinary approach. They're hoping to find clues that could lead to breakthroughs in our understanding of alien intelligence. And until we find a definitive answer, we can keep sparking our curiosity and imagination. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. Yeah. 
It felt like being on a spaceship, traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples. But because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light but sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut 
in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. Antarctica is the most remote continent on the planet. It has 90% of the world's ice, but it's considered a desert because the annual rainfall is only about 8 inches. You'd probably never think it was a desert if you look at it, since it's white and full of wildlife. But Antarctica is not only what it appears to be on the surface. There is so much hidden beneath it, and even above it. Atlantis has long been a mystery for humankind. Did it ever exist? And if yes, where was it located? One of the theories supports that the Atlantean civilization could have thrived and flourished in the Antarctic continent when it was still uncovered by ice. Due to the Earth's cyclical eras, this is the periods of ice and interglacial periods it was believed that Antarctica was actually a tropical forest. And, well, a recent Google Earth picture found some interesting ruins buried deep within a lake bed on the icy continent. It's unclear to which civilization these remains belong to, but some theorists believe that it could perfectly be Atlantis. And these frozen Antarctic lakes are holding much more under them. In the 1970s, scientists were surprised to find large lakes under the ice plaques in the frozen continent. Over 400 lake beds are believed to exist under layers of ice. Lake Vostok, for instance, the largest subglacial lake over there, is buried beneath two miles of thick ice. There are pristine blue ice caves hidden under there as well. The water in these lakes remains liquid due to the small levels of geothermal heat from the Earth's core. And some scientists believe that some lakes are around 15 million years old. Talk about the old days, huh? Now, amongst the unique phenomena that occur in the continent, let's say Antarctica is home to an extremely weird waterfall. 
The year was 1911 when Australian geologists wondered about the so-called Blood Falls. He was extremely puzzled by this red stream of liquid pouring from a small hillside amongst the Antarctic ice. After years of studying it, it was understood what caused the redness was the high iron content in the water. The last piece of the puzzle came when scientists discovered that there was an underground lake with water full of oxidized iron nearby, which was what caused the blood fall to exist in the first place. And speaking of puzzles, this image might be quite puzzling. After all, why on earth would anyone need to take cash to Antarctica? Well, a little history first. Back in 1956, the U.S. founded McMurdo Research Station, which is the biggest science hub in the continent to date. At its peak, the McMurdo Station hosts from 200 to 1,000 scientists. And these people need money to buy coffee, pizza, and other things to meet their daily needs. That's when Wells Fargo decided to install an ATM there. Oh, and they even set a Guinness World Record this way. The Wells Fargo ATM at McMurdo Station is the most southern one in the world. And it's the loneliest ATM in the world as well, as there isn't another one for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The freezing temperatures in Antarctica can make the continent hostile to human life. Actually, Antarctica is the coldest, driest, and windiest continent on our planet. The average temperature along the coast is around 14 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you head towards the Antarctic hinterlands, it gets even colder than that. The interior of the continent can register temperatures of around negative 71 degrees Fahrenheit. On the bright side, these freezing conditions can account for some mesmerizing phenomena, such as ice bubbles. These bubbles frozen inside some Antarctic lakes are bubbles of methane gas. The gas released from the melting of glaciers ends up freezing midway and makes for a beautiful and exotic scene. I guess methane never looked this pretty before, did it? A few years ago, scientists were taken aback by a giant hole the size of the Netherlands in one Antarctic lake. For scale, that's more or less the size of Lake Michigan. These holes are called polinias, and they are a natural phenomenon in the continent. However, this one is the biggest scientists have ever seen since the 1970s. So you'll understand, polinias are massive holes in a sea of ice. Most of them occur along the continent's coast, but this new one was found in the Weddell Sea, much farther from the shore. Scientists are still trying to understand how that happened and what its implications are for the climate in the region. There's one feature in the continent that looks completely man-made and has even sparked several theories around the world regarding its origins. I mean, this formation looks exactly like other man-made pyramids, doesn't it? The only difference is that this is actually a natural rock formation and has existed for a very long time. It was first found during an expedition in the 1910s and was kept secret ever since. It was nicknamed Pyramid, but its correct scientific name is Nunatak, which is simply a peak of rock sticking out above a glacier or an ice sheet. There are other famous peaks that look pyramid-shaped, such as the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So no, this really isn't a human construction, we're sure of it. And the list of fascinating discoveries on the ice continent goes on. An artificial intelligence program was analyzing a set of data on Antarctica when it came across a stunning discovery. There may be up to 300,000 undiscovered meteorites to be found in the icy field of the continent. The truth is, meteorites have been falling on the continent for millions of years. But it was only 110 years ago that the first one was found. And guess what? Recently, researchers found a Martian meteorite in East Antarctica. It was the biggest one found in the last 25 years, and it weighed about 165 pounds. Now, usually fire and ice are rather a tricky combination. So I'm guessing you wouldn't say that Antarctica hosts an active volcano, right? But it does. 
The volcano, known as Mount Erebus, is the southernmost active volcano in the world with liquid magma and lava boiling for eons. Actually, Mount Erebus has been active for over a million years, and it's Antarctica's second highest volcano with a height of 12,000 feet. We've mentioned before that Antarctica wasn't always icy, but could you imagine a huge rainforest covering the entire continent? This isn't science fiction, it's actually true. Leaf impressions and fossilized wood clearly show signs of tropical trees in the region. Fossil research has also revealed something magnificent. Antarctica is home to the oldest worm in the world. According to National Geographic, sperm fossils found in Antarctica reveal a long extinct species of worm that is around 50 million years old. Scientists claim that this discovery is beyond important to studying some evolutionary relationships and say that this was only possible due to the freezing of such samples for thousands of years. Antarctica is a continent rich in biodiversity. Penguins, polar bears, and seals are just some of the animals we know that exist down there. But there is also a rare and fascinating species of fish that inhabits Antarctic waters. Popularly known as the see-through fish, this species is as bizarre as it is beautiful. This fish had to adapt to survive the cold water temperature in Antarctica, so much so that it evolved into a unique being. As well as a transparent body, this fish has transparent blood, making it completely see-through. This is because they lack the protein hemoglobin, which gives blood its red color. Pretty neat, huh? When you think of Antarctica, you probably think of icebergs, right? So here are some fun facts about it. Did you know that icebergs have a lifespan of about 3,000 years? And that together with Greenland, Antarctica is one of the world's primary sources of icebergs. Icebergs can reach 600 to 700 feet below the surface of the water, and around 90% of an iceberg is hidden underwater. That's where the expression, tip of the iceberg, comes from. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, Let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though. 
so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by IceSat happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, 
there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer. But when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha uh ha. -huh. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica's ice blanket makes up 70% of the world's freshwater reserves. Imagine what would happen if it melted. The global sea levels would be raised by almost 200. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress, but there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows? Maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent 
and called it Antarctos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones, though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the northern hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820, during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens, because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals, with their furry bodies and special songs. These marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, 
and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. Meteorites rain down on Earth every single year. Almost 63% of the 69,268 meteorites scientists have officially recorded in the Meteoritical Bulletin database have been picked up from a polar desert. From where? Antarctica. It's technically a desert because it gets little precipitation. The continent receives an average equivalent of about 6 inches of water annually, mostly from snow. The interior parts are even drier. Not much action happens to meteorites there. Deserts are like safe storage closets for them, and it's easier to spot meteorites there. In total, there are around 42,000 meteorites in Antarctica. Most of them have been spotted since 1976. The Sahara Desert in Africa isn't far behind. Nomads and treasure hunters have discovered over 14,000 meteorites there, especially since 1995. Then there's the Arabian Peninsula, mainly Oman, where they've unearthed about 4,200 meteorites. So why does Antarctica take the crown for its meteorite collection compared to other areas? It's not because more meteorites land there. Statistically, they can land anywhere. Antarctica wins because it's great at showing off these space rocks. The icy environment keeps them in mint condition. The contrast between the ice and space rocks makes spotting meteorites easy. Plus, there are spots called meteorite stranding zones, where the geology, ice flow, and climate team up to gather meteorites. Here's the sci-fi part. Satellites help researchers find meteorites. They use these space gadgets to spot the best places to search. Some of these meteorites are ancient, like a million years old. Now, when you think about how many meteorites there are, it's a bit like a pie chart. If you measure their weight, instead of just counting them, things get interesting. Antarctica's slice of the pie gets smaller. On average, an Antarctic meteorite weighs about 2 ounces, like a small bar of chocolate. Ooh, chocolate. But in the Sahara, they've got all sizes, so the average is about a pound. Now, let's talk about meteorites in action. Only a tiny bit, maybe just 1.8% of all meteorites found have been seen falling. These are called falls. Clever name. Meteorite detectives, or meteoriticists, get all excited when they see that. The other 98% are finds. Someone stumbled upon them without seeing the meteorite take its cosmic leap. So when we only look at the ones that fell from the sky, most are called stony meteorites. These are like regular fellas of the meteorite world, but there's also a special kind called iron meteorites, or just irons. There are also super rare meteorites, called mesositerites and pilosities, that are like a mix of metal and regular rock stuff. In places where humans live, like North America, people tend to find more iron meteorites than those that fell. That's because iron ones are usually bigger and more eye-catching. Farmers found some of these while they were working in their fields. Oh, a surprise! A bunch of gigantic iron meteorites from places like China, Namibia, and the US make the chart slices huge. Now, check out this adventure. A group of scientists braving the crazy cold of Antarctica's icy desert to uncover some fresh meteorites found what they had been looking for. In fact, one of the meteorites weighed almost 17 pounds. The ones like that are pretty huge. Do they have an impact on Earth? Science says yes, they do. Meteorite impacts are more common than you think. About 17 meteorites smack Earth's surface every single day. Since most of the planet is covered with water, there are loads of places without people around. That's why these hits often go unnoticed. Most meteorites are just small bits zipping through our atmosphere anyway. By the time they touch down, they get tiny thanks to all the friction against the air. Not all meteorite impacts are wimpy. Some supersized ones have rocked our world. Remember when dinosaurs said bye-bye? Yeah, that might have been the fault of a huge asteroid. These meteorite hits are random, and they happen all the time. Scientists have uncovered evidence of a massive meteor impact even before the famous dinosaur wipeout. 
This impact is thought to have triggered the biggest extinction event in Earth's history. The 300-mile-wide impact crater is chilling over a mile beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. This mega-event occurred about 250 million years ago. The epicenter of the crater is in the Wilkes Land area of East Antarctica. It might have started the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. It was a big landmass that included parts of what are now South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and more. So, the Gondwanda supercontinent started to chip off by creating a tectonic rift that pushed Australia northward. This Wilkesland impact surpasses the one that led to the dinosaur's extinction in terms of scale and could have caused catastrophic consequences at the time. The Hoba meteorite is a huge junk of space stuff chilling on Earth. It crash-landed about 80,000 years ago in Namibia. The thing is a heavyweight, like twice the size of the next biggest meteorite ever found. Interestingly, it also has a weird flat shape. Nobody's moved it since it fell, so we really don't know how deep it's hidden. But experts think it skidded along ground like a stone skipping on a lake because it landed at an angle. That's why it didn't leave a big crater when it hit the ground. And it was discovered by chance. A farmer found the world's biggest single meteorite. He was plowing his field with an ox and a regular plow. Suddenly, he heard a scraping noise. It was the metal plow meeting the iron meteorite. The Mosey meteorite from Tanzania has been staying underground for centuries before scientists gave it a proper look. The locals love this space gem, calling it Commando. It was known in town for generations. Mosey is made of the same stuff as its other meteorite friends on Earth, about 90% iron and 8% nickel. It weighs 25 tons. Let's talk about the El Chaco meteorite, part of the Campo del Cielo meteorite crew in Argentina. Imagine an almost 24-square-mile playground for space rocks. El Chaco, weighing 37 tons, decided to show up fashionably late in 1969. So, what if you found a meteorite? How can you tell for sure that it's not just some random rock? These space visitors have a few features that make them stand out from regular rocks. Firstly, meteorites are often heavier than they look because they're packed with heavy metals and dense materials. Secondly, most meteorites have some metallic iron, so magnets usually stick to them. If you've got a rock that's not magnetic, try suspending the magnet from a string. The third clue lies in their unusual shapes. Iron-nickel meteorites aren't smooth and round. Stony meteorites usually have a thin, crispy crust on the outside. It looks as if their surface melted a bit while moving through the atmosphere. Sounds like pizza to me. Suppose these tips won't help on your quest. Then consider this. Light-colored crystals are not meteorites. Those pretty things, like quartz, are common on Earth. But they don't hang out on other planets or moons in our solar system. Do you know those bubbly holes in volcanic rocks or melted metal slag on Earth? Meteorites don't have those either. Plus, scratching a meteorite shouldn't leave a mark. But if you scratch a dense rock and get a dark or red mark, the rock contains minerals like magnetite or hematite, which meteorites don't usually have. If you suspect finding a meteor in your backyard or something, try these tips. Just remember to be sure you've got to give rocks and minerals a real-life look from experts. And if you see one falling towards you, always remember to duck.